Hi, it's Dr. Lakeer Wright, and uh, welcome to Right Now Allergy Updates with Dr. Wright. I'm just going to give it a minute as uh, people sign in. Okay, great. I see some people signing in. We'll just give it a few seconds here. Okay, great. I see my guest here has joined. Hi, Courtney. And I see some people logging on. So we'll just give it a few more seconds here. Very excited to get started. <laughs> oh, we've got lots of people joining us today. Yes, I see lots of waves out there. <laughs> okay, I think that we can get started now. So Again, welcome to Right Now Allergy Updates with Dr. Wright, and I am uh, Dr. Lakia Wright. I am a board-certified allergist immunologist, and I'm also medical director at Thermo Fisher Scientific in the Immunodiagnostics Division of U.S. Clinical Affairs. I, I know that's that's sort of like a mouthful, and so I uh, want to welcome you know my guest Courtney, and and we'll get to Courtney just in a, a, a second before I go over. Um, some housekeeping. So this video is meant to be educational and, um, you know, provide information to facilitate a conversation, um, you know, with your healthcare provider or your clinician, and it does not substitute a medical advice. And so I would like to formally welcome my guest, Courtney Kwong Hing, co-founder of Zestful and co-host of the Itch podcast, Courtney is a fierce advocate in the allergy community, um, having firsthand experiences with allergy. And so I'm so excited to talk to her today. So welcome, Courtney. And then, you know, Courtney is our special guest in celebration of World Allergy Week, um, you know, hosted by the World Allergy Organization, which the focus uh, this year is on uh, anaphylaxis. So Courtney will share her experience of living with allergies, you know, telling, uh, you know, specifically speaking to her experience with uh, food allergies. And we're really here to have that important conversation about allergies, anaphylaxis, and how to show support uh, for the allergy uh, community. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop the questions in the uh, chat bar or any comments, and we'll get to them uh, shortly. And so before I dive into my questions for Courtney, what I'm going to do is just go over some background information about uh, anaphylaxis. And so there was a study uh, published in 2013 uh, specifically about anaphylaxis in America, but these trends, we see them globally and in other countries. So the most common triggers um, reported for anaphylaxis were food and medications, then followed by insect stings. And then 42% of the patients in this study, they did seek treatment within 15 minutes but only 11% self-administered epinephrine, and then 6.4% didn't have any treatment. So we know with these sort of statistics from this one particular study that we need to do more uh, education, raise more awareness. And so we're gonna talk to Courtney about her experience um, living with uh, allergies and so that we can help you know move the conversation forward and help to raise uh, awareness and so i've talked enough and so my first question is for courtney you know can you tell us about yourself and and why you're so passionate about allergies yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me on. It's funny because we've talked before and I did the interviewing and so <laughs> it's to be on the other side. I'm not used to that. So this yeah. is going to be interesting. Um, but thank you. Um, so yeah, I like to say that I only know life with food allergies because I was diagnosed with a food allergy when I was four months old. Um, my dad just put a little bit of peanut butter right here and all of a sudden his daughter was not recognizable and they had to rush me to the hospital and that's what started our journey. Uh, and then I had been tested a couple more times in my life and my allergy list grew. I've had anaphylactic reactions to three different foods and only, well, I used to say only one of them is in the top eight, but now two of them are in the top nine. Oh. 
<laughs> so that's kind of an exciting thing that's happened. Um, but yeah, so for me, I think that there's a lot that goes on when you have multiple food allergies or when you just have one food allergy. It's that people see food allergies as a problem and they sometimes when you're newly diagnosed, you see it as a wall and you just see your life completely stopped and you're just stuck against this wall and you know, you're not comfortable with living life anymore because you just feel like you need to navigate something completely new. You're afraid of everything. And I, I think that's a completely valid experience to have. But what I'm passionate about is to show people that it's, it's something that you can come, like it's a hurdle that you can get over, right? It's, it's, it's just a different way of looking at the things that you used to do. And it's, not a barrier. It's just a new, a new normal, which is like a, a term we like to use a lot now with this pandemic. So it is a new normal, you know, you don't do things like you used to, but it doesn't mean that you can't live a full life. Yes. So that's one aspect that makes me super passionate about sharing my allergies journey and also just like empowering people to share their allergy journeys. The other thing, and it goes very close hand in hand, is that sometimes living with food allergies feels very isolated you feel isolating, you feel like you are on this journey alone. There are so many other people going through this journey and you have a whole team of people around you who can also join you on this journey. So again, it's about raising awareness that you aren't alone and that we've got this and you know, the community's got your back. So if you're worried or stressed out or there's something that you're just not sure how to navigate, there are people out there who can help you. Yes, and, and so you bring up such an important point about sort of the comprehensive, you know, nature of food allergies. And, and I know as an allergist, I, you know, I think about um, getting my patients the proper diagnosis and a comprehensive treatment plan. So not only is it sort of the education about how to avoid your allergens, but then also there's a psychosocial element to it. Um, and that I have to acknowledge and, and to reinforce my patients, as you're explaining, Courtney, that they're not alone. This is something they can do. They have to take these precautions, but they're very capable of doing it. They, we will, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later, but yes, anaphylaxis is a life-threatening, you know, uh, reaction. It can be life-threatening. And so, um, you know, we have to equip people with, you know, how do you recognize the signs and symptoms, when to use their epinephrine auto injector. And, and that sort of comprehensive, you know, sort of treatment plan will help patients, you know, get through it and know that there's a huge food allergy or allergy in general um, uh, support system out there, community. And mm -hmm. so I think that's so important. And that sort of leads me to my uh, next question about, you know, how can we raise awareness about the impact of allergies and why is advocacy so important? Yeah, so I think that advocacy is really important because unless you know what it's like to live with a, a life-threatening food allergy, you really have no idea. You know, if you don't know what food could potentially do to your body in terms of an anaphylactic reaction, it's hard for other people to comprehend why we might be asking them 120,000 different questions about just a sausage like it's just a sausage it's just meat and spices and you're like oh but it's not just meat and spices to me so it's it's about sharing that comprehensive again to use that term that comprehensive awareness of food is food but it, there's so much going on there's so many nuances to things just like a can of tuna you know a can of tuna is not just tuna there's so many different aspects to it so just raising awareness so that people fully understand what it means to have a food allergy and how it's not just avoiding one food you know this one food could show up in so many different places and i think that it's about really being open with your story and open and to educate other people who don't have food allergies to understand it in a whole way. And I think it's, it's easy to think, oh, it's easy. You just avoid peanuts. How hard is that? It's like, well, do you know where peanuts can show up? Or do you know how hard it is sometimes to find something that is safe because it might not be, you know, it might be manufactured in a place that also has peanuts. So it's like, 
is raising that awareness. And when we raise that awareness with people who don't have food allergies, we're paving a way forward for other people with food allergies. Because every positive encounter we have, where we educate others, we're potentially helping someone else with food allergies down the line when they interact with that person. And that's just super easy, day to day, get out there and advocate and educate. Yes, thank you. I, I, yeah, a advocacy and education are, you know, two key pillars. And as you mentioned, there is sort of a lot of misunderstanding and, and misinformation out there about allergies, particularly food allergies. And so, you know, as a clinician, I, I want to, as an allergist, I want to put out, you know, credible, you know, medical information out there. And then also, as you mentioned, as a patient, it's so important for you to share your story. Um, so because in the end, it really helps to affect change to have sort of this two prong uh, approach. And I know that um, you participate in the hashtag that kid campaign to also share your uh, personal uh, story about living with uh, food allergies. And then that brings me to my, uh, you know, next question, which is, what is your 360 allergy action plan? Um, you know, that sort of comprehensive plan that we were talking about because it, because it really affects, you know, every aspect of your life. Um, how do you manage allergies on a daily basis when it comes to eating out and traveling? Can you tell us more about that, Courtney? Yeah, so I like to, I want to prove by saying that I really try not to let food allergies dictate my life. So I don't want them to be the reason I'm not doing something. Yes. There have been occasions where it's just not going to be possible for me. But that's that's my reality, right? That not everything is going to be possible to me. Just like not everything is going to be possible to someone in a different circumstance. Sometimes not every door is open for all of us. And we just have to frame that, you know. We just have to know that sometimes it's just not going to work out. But that's okay because there's always a different road to take. So... I think what you said about education is super important and it's also important for the patient. So knowing as much as you can about your diagnosis has really helped me create this 360 plan of, I feel like I know exactly what's going on with my diagnosis. I understand what's what I've been diagnosed with. And then I've worked with my allergist to create a very concrete action plan. And I've got that into my muscle memory so that I know I'm prepared for any situation. And I think when you're prepared for any situation, you can go forward and live your day to day without having food allergies front of mind. So it's really about having that preparation and having that understanding of if this happens, I need to take this. If this happens, I need to take this. And just being very clear about what your symptoms are and what your action plan would be. So I think that that for me is what creates the ground of a 360 plan. And that really goes into travel. It goes into going out for dinner. It goes into dating. When you have that solid idea of what's going on, like what, you know, it's about knowing your symptoms and knowing your steps. And if you know your symptoms and your steps, I think you're going to be okay. And you have your way of talking about your food allergy. You know, you know that you're communicating them clearly to other people and you feel confident when you communicate those to other people as well. I think the hardest part is when you, you shy away from communicating you have food allergies and you don't feel like you're heard. And that is where maybe you can get into a little bit of trouble. Yes, yes. And, and, and I, I really like this uh, slogan that the World Allergy Organization has, um, you know, be prepared, um, you know, uh, be, be aware, be prepared, save lives, it, specifically when it comes to anaphylaxis. So I also want the group to, uh, the audience to, to check out the World Allergy Organization uh, educational uh, resources about anaphylaxis. And like you said, Courtney, knowing those signs and symptoms uh, is key. And, and knowing, you know, uh, about your food allergens and all your allergens and where they can be, because you, when you think of food, you just think of, you know, food products as it is in eating, but then, you know, it can extend mm -hmm. to cosmetics or even uh, medications can, um, you know, be based in, they can have some basis of, uh, you know, incorporating food allergies. So it's really important to know where, um, you know, these, uh, you know, allergens can uh, surface and to educate other people about, you know, the sort of different dimensions. 
And so um, since we do have this focus on anaphylaxis for the World Allergy Week, mm -hmm. I wanted you to tell me about, you know, can you share with us any experiences you've had uh, with anaphylaxis? Yeah, I can. So I, um, I've never used my EpiPen <laughs> and I know, or my adrenaline auto injector because I don't, I've, I've carried many different types of pens. It's moving to different countries, you always encounter some new pen that you get prescribed. But I know now that if I ever, you know, have a symptom that is telling me it's an anaphylactic reaction to go forward and use my auto injector. And that is part of this education is that I've drilled it into my head that this is the step I need to take. And I think we talk about this on our podcast episode too, where I, I, I talk about how I was trained in the, the 1990s way of diagnosing, like of treating my allergy. And now I know that there is a better way and there's a safer way. So I need to remember that. But actually I've had um, five anaphylactic reactions that have led me to the hospital. And what was really interesting is that um, all of them kind of had a different set of like things that happened to me. So there wasn't one exact way that told me this is an anaphylactic reaction. It was multi-system, so I was feeling it in many different places, but it didn't happen in the same order every time. But what did happen was I always had this, they call it the impending sense of doom, I think, where I felt like something was just not right. Like there was just something in my head that said, this is not right, we need to go to the hospital, which it should have said, this is not right, use your EpiPen and then go to the hospital. But, <laughs> but no, it will. But something said to me, something is not happening here that's normal. And I could just tell I need to go. Like there's a switch in my head that said something something is happening in your body that you're not sure what's going on, but it's not safe right now. So, yeah, so that's I was so important with you raised, Courtney. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yes. Continue. Oh no. I was just going to ask you about the, um, the impending sense of doom perhaps, because I feel like that's a, a weird symptom to read about. And then when you, when you read it and you're like, Oh my gosh, that's exactly what I experienced. What is it? Like it's such a strange thing to read on the list of like body. It's like body, 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 body. And then this weird like impending sense of doom. You're like, did a poet just get a, get access to this list of symptoms? Yes. No, I, your experience is so common, right? Like that, you know, you, you experience anaphylaxis and some patients they get, they, they hear about the signs and symptoms. They may have that sense of impending doom, but then to take action with the epinephrine auto injector, that's another sort of um, leap and bound to take, which can be scary. So we're here today and you're, I, I love that you shared your, your experience about, you know what to do. I, I hope that anaphylaxis doesn't happen to you, but you know if it happens again, then you, you would use your epinephrine auto injector because that is uh, the, the treatment, the primary treatment for anaphylaxis. And so this impending sense of doom, we talk a lot about the organ systems involved, shortness of breath, sensation of throat closing, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. We talk about anaphylaxis as two or more symptoms involved. What we talk less about is even before that happens, many patients report this impending sense of doom. And so your body sees an allergen and you have these antibodies. Those are called the IgE antibodies. And so when your body sees the allergen, it's saying, hey, you know, alarm signals are going off, the, you know, the antibodies um, are, are there and they're triggering your allergy cells. So that impending sense of doom is saying, hey, foreign attack, you know, mm -hmm. let's go on the attack. There's, there's something in my body that shouldn't be. And then you can have, um, you know, the gamut of symptoms you could have, you know, some people think of hives as always being there. It doesn't have to, it's two organs or more. It could be the skin and something else, or it could, it could be nausea and vomiting and feeling like you're going to pass out or you're having the sensation of throat closing. But that impending sense of doom, you know, many patients report it even before those bodily manifestations uh, come out. And it's really, you know, likely because your body is saying, hey, there's something foreign, I have to go on the attack. And so it's, it's letting you know something's not right. And so you have to be aware of the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis that we mentioned, but then also that 
when your body is warning you even before those signs and symptoms, um, you know, uh, may appear. So I think that that is so important that you bring up that impending sense of due. And then some patients, they also um, can have a sensation of like flushing. So they might feel warm. Uh, they might have an impending sense of doom. And then they might turn red, you know, and, and you can have one of these symptoms or, you know, combination of these symptoms when you have an allergic reaction with anaphylaxis is two or more organ systems involved. But then also I want to stress that severe allergic reactions, they can also start with sensation of throat closing. So of course you would use your epinephrine auto injector if you have mm -hmm. that one organ involvement, such as respiratory, the, you know, the, the, um, lungs or the windpipe, a windpipe, you know, cutting off. And so I think that that is excellent that you've shared your story because it really illustrates that patients, they can get scared to sort of use their epinephrine um, auto injector. But we, we are here to, um, you said that your action plan is drilled in your muscle memory. We want to make sure that many patients just like you have it drilled in the muscle memory. I tell patients, keep your action plan in front of your refrigerator. Take a, you know, on, on top of your refrigerator. Uh, it, you can take a picture of it, keep it in your phone, have it in your muscle memory so that you know what to do um, if anaphylaxis were to occur. And now I do have... Uh, just a couple more questions for you. You know, what advice would you have for your younger self about the management of allergies? Yeah, so I think I'm going to piggyback actually on what you just mentioned. And I would love to have told myself that you need to practice the just in case, you yes. know, because I haven't used my EpiPen or my adrenaline um, auto injector is I don't think I had enough stress that wasn't stressed enough with me. And I think it's important for you to train that muscle, right? To continuously talk over scenarios, to continuously to say, if this happens, this is what I'm gonna do. And I think as a teenager or as a child, if you talk that through with your parents, you're also gonna show them that you're taking steps to also manage your food allergy. So it's like every month, maybe you talk it through just in case it happens, just so you prepare. And I think being prepared is really, really key to um, feeling like you've got this, you know, feeling like you can manage your allergy. And I think that's what I would tell my younger self is like, talk about it. Talk about what might happen if you do have an allergic reaction, because we don't talk about that enough. We just really don't want to have an allergic reaction. But in case anything ever does happen, what do you do? And if you're not prepared, then that's where it's scary. Yes. And, and so to piggyback on that, um, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in, in all the years, and I'm, it might be similar response, but in all the years of managing your allergies, like, what's the most important lesson you learned? The most important lesson would be don't be afraid to talk about your allergies and advocate for yourself in any situation. So don't feel sorry or apologize that you have food allergies. Let people know that you have food allergies and the way that you communicate that will set the tone for how they treat you. So if you communicate that really confidently, then they will treat you more seriously than if you kind of brush it off. Then they think, oh, they've just brushed off their food allergies. It mustn't be that bad. So I don't have to take as much precaution as I thought I might have to because they seem pretty okay with it. So I think it's about really don't deny the fact that you have food allergies, own it, own it confidently, and talk to people. And you know what, like, it's not going to be that bad. I think we always fear people's responses, but people are generally much nicer than you give them credit for sometimes. Yes, that is uh, such an important point that you raised, because when it comes to allergies, you know, food allergies, there's no apologies necessary. And, and it, allergies can be life threatening. So we know, as you said, you know, you can be afraid of people's reactions, but they're generally much more understanding, especially if you explain it to them, that this, you know, can be life-threatening um, because they may not be aware. And so you, you definitely want to mm -hmm. put that out there and not be apologetic about it because it is your health. And so what I want to turn to is, we don't, um, I think we have maybe one or two questions here. And one of the questions, um, and it's sort of part of this uh, world allergy theme is, you know, why are, why is the 
why is there a rise in allergies and 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 that um is a very hard question <laughs> to answer because it's likely you know multifactorial and then we of course have different types of allergies so we focused on um a lot we talked a lot about food allergies uh you know courtney and i have focused on food allergies and and as an allergist this is something that's you know under investigation in the scientific community and we do see that you know um uh, climate change could be playing a role here as far as the way that, you know, crops are growing. They might be revving up the immune system. Our diet, because we see that there's been a rise um, in allergies over, uh, like, you know, since, uh, you know, 2010 uh, or even a little bit uh, earlier than that. Uh, it, and we see that perhaps there could be some changes in our diet and, and sort of eating processed foods. And then that also impacting what we call our microbiome, so the bacteria mm. that's in our gut, and that helps to sort of program our immune system or get used to seeing things that it hasn't seen before. And so those are some reasons why, you know, it uh, this may be contributed to the rise in food allergies. And, and one important thing that uh, we often raise, which we can definitely do something about now, is the early introduction of food. So we thought mm. that before, you should just wait to introduce that big, uh, you know, the top eight or top nine food allergens. But we know with research, particularly uh, with uh, peanut, we have the most data for it. The earlier you introduce it into your child, you should definitely talk to your pediatrician about this, the more likely their immune system may be up accepting of the food and, and, and less likely to mount um, this allergic response. So that's really important. And then one thing that we didn't talk about is environmental allergies. And those are on the rise um, as well. And as I mentioned with uh, climate change, we see longer pollen seasons, so more, uh, you know, um, opportunity for exposure. And then with the swings in temperature, you know, the, the pollens may be um, more potent and then uh, sort of coming out sort of full-fledged and revving up that uh, immune system. So those are some of the reasons, uh, you know, why. And then another question I, I, um, I have here is, you know, well, why get tested, you know? And so I'll, I'll specifically focus on uh, food allergy because even you mentioned, Courtney, like, you want to know what you're allergic to so you, that you can avoid it. So the most important thing, which you've uh, mentioned, Courtney, is that you have to talk to your healthcare provider. You have to talk to your allergist. What are your symptoms? Because it starts with the symptoms. And so, because the testing is helping to aid in the diagnosis, but you as a patient are providing those symptoms um, for your doctor to try to hone in, you know, what would be appropriate to test for based on uh, those symptoms. And so, those were our two questions. And what I'm going to do now is turn, over, turn it over to Courtney to ask her about her five tips for um, managing her uh, food allergies. So could you tell us about that, Courtney? Yeah, I can. I had my cheat sheet printed out, but then <laughs> I was like, I have to remember what I said, but I have to pop <laughs> my head because it just looks like I ran out of ink. <laughs> it's like, what is this blank page? My cheat sheet's gone. Um, yeah, so I think I mentioned this before, but it's really like knowing your action plan, drilling that in. So that's my number one tip is know your action plan because if you're confident with it, you can be confident about managing your food allergies. Number two would be know as much as you can about your diagnosis. Um, and from good sources of information, and I can't stress that more, but your doctor and credible internet sources. And by knowing more about your diagnosis, it's not only knowing about what is a food allergy and how do you manage a food allergy, but what are you actually allergic to? Like you mentioned, Dr. Wright, that's super important because I know that I, I've in the past had this tendency to want to blanket out all of the things that could potentially be an allergen, but there's no reason to just shut out a whole group of foods when there's no proof that I'm actually allergic to them. So when you get tested and when you know about what you're actually allergic to, you feel so much more confident in managing the things that you're allergic to, right? Because you feel more informed. So those are the two kind of big ones. The other ones are very simple. If you dine out, always bring an allergy card or a chef card. I feel like that was a game changer for me. It's a, a really great resource for not only you, but for the kitchen and the waiters. And that also, again, 
starts that conversation and helps advocate for other people with food allergies along the line. Number two, uh, number four, if I'm going backwards, number four is always carry your medicine. That's like easy. That's the number one thing you have to leave the house, bring your meds, you know, so don't forget that. And then the last thing is to try and find some support groups or some people to be on your side to help you manage your food allergy. You know, you aren't alone in managing your food allergy. Everyone you surround yourself with is in one form also managing a food allergy, you know. You're going out for dinner with a group of friends. They're also, in a sense, managing your food allergy. So find a support group, whether it's in your close circle or whether it's one in the food allergy community who really understands what you might be going through and who can help you out if you're feeling a little bit down. Excellent. Thank you for sharing, Courtney. And, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, you know, thank you, Courtney, for being our very special guest and sharing your story. Um, and then also, I want to uh, prompt the audience to check out uh, the itch podcast and, and we even have an episode about cross reactivity which is like you know um, a very difficult topic uh, to discuss what needs to be addressed you know how are those foods related and, and and how do you talk to your doctor about which ones you you know should avoid or which ones could potentially be safe that's a conversation for you and your doctor and we we sort of tackle some of that to to help facilitate that conversation and in celebration of World Allergy Week, you know, we want people to continue to share the experiences and, and resources using the hashtag Stop Anaphylaxis and hashtag World Allergy Week. So let's all together help to uh, raise awareness. And then, you know, if you like uh, this video, please share it and, and, and give it a like. And in the video description, we'll have a link to Allergy Insider so that you can uh, have more educational uh, resources. So thanks again, Courtney. Uh, you know, stay safe and uh, stay tuned for the next episode. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Wright. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>